We are being told that building structures and subsequent colonization on the moon in the coming years would be possible. But is it really the case? In this video, we'll reveal the real and probably unforeseen challenges of lunar construction that might just make you question everything you know about the possibility of living on the moon. I'm Abhishek and welcome to Revolutionary Engineering. The moon holds the promise of new beginnings, but building on its dusty surface is not as easy as it's shown to us. Even the best 3D printed structures cannot stay there for long, and for not just one, but many reasons. Let's dive in to confront the incredible challenges of constructing on the moon. You see, the engineers and scientists are betting big on two technologies that they believe can help us build houses and colonize the moon. One of these is 3D printing, while the other one is relatively lesser known and related to the inflatable structures for homes. We'll look at why each of these technologies are not reliable and why we need something very different to actually see the vision of houses on the moon becoming reality. The Fundamental Problem with 3D Printing on Moon Rocket propulsion technology has advanced by just a very tiny amount since the time it has been deployed for space applications. The intrinsic problem with rocket propulsion is that the rockets require and have to carry an insane amount of fuel to generate the necessary thrust to escape Earth's gravity. Think of it like filling up your car with gas for a long road trip. The more stuff you want to carry, the more gas you need. And it gets expensive, right? And yes, on a trip to moon, there's no gas station on the way. Heavy payloads increases the overall weight of the rocket, forcing it to carry extra fuel. Also, heavier payloads require stronger rocket structures. This becomes limiting from the cost standpoint. 3D printing on moon would demand autonomous robotic systems that need to be transported from Earth. This would drastically increase the cost of launching. And if the cost problem is not a problem, then we can manage to land 3D printing systems using bigger and more powerful rockets. But this is just the beginning. The real problems begin after landing on moon. And first among these is the collection of massive amounts of regolith to be used as a material for 3D printing houses. Now you might think, how could collection of regolith be a problem? In fact, it's the only thing on moon that's available in plenty. So ask yourself a simple question. What is the first step in collecting this regolith? Many of you might have already guessed the right answer. Yes, the regolith needs to be scooped from the moon's surface. And from the data, it's known that moon's regolith is abrasive, containing fine, sharp-edged particles. The abrasive nature of the regolith can quickly wear down mechanical components, including scoops, leading to equipment damage and frequent maintenance. If a scooping is to be planned with rovers, it would need quite an amount of energy to scoop off. This enormous energy need will force the deployment of larger number of solar panels for providing enough power. But these are just the problems that can be foreseen superficially. The next challenge that we are going to reveal will bring out the core shortcomings with 3D printing on Moon. Almost all 3D printers that are being conceived use a traditional approach of either melting of material or baking to enable layer-to-layer -layer addition and achieving the desired structural strength. Now we have already seen in multiple moon missions that keeping lander and rover warm needs a heat source, usually a radioisotope heating unit or RHU, and maintaining warmth using a low power heat source of the order of just few watts during the lunar night is a complex task. Now imagine the astounding amount of heat that would be required to craft an entire 3D printed structure in this way. To estimate this amount of heat required, you need to think at a very fundamental level. To 3D print the structure in this way, regolith needs to be melted. The amount of energy to melt this regolith depends on its latent heat of fusion, which is the energy required to change it from solid to liquid at a constant temperature. And can you predict the melting point of regolith? It's close to 1500 Kelvin or over 1200 degrees Celsius. Using the data from tests conducted on different simulants that closely resemble lunar regolith, it turns out that the heat required to melt just a kilogram of this could be in the range of 400 to over 900 kilojoules. And not just this, we would first need energy to raise its temperature to a value where it would then start to melt. This heat is called sensible heat. 
Without going into calculations, it's sufficient to know that just to melt a kilogram of lunar regolith, it would need energy of the order of 2 to 3000 kilojoules. But at such high temperatures, there will be significant radiation losses from the molten regolith itself, making this energy need increase even further. Generating such a degree of heat to build tons of 3D printed structures can only be achieved using a very high power lasers or large solar concentrators that need to be deployed first on moon. Transporting them from Earth via rockets would certainly present an exhilarating challenge. Now many may argue that recent advancements have eliminated this step of melting or baking like the one envisioned by Space Factory, a company testing a 3D printing tech with NASA at Kennedy Space Center in a lunar environmental chamber, designed to mimic the exact conditions at the lunar south pole. Here they are using a polymer binder to be mixed with lunar regolith. As of now, it's unclear whether or not they would use the baking or sintering process for strength. But maintaining adequate layer-to-layer -layer bonding without the use of heating methods is a tricky part, especially when the lunar environment has extreme temperature fluctuations that can cause cracks in the structure. And remember, the structure must stand up for years, and not just for days or months. How the printed material would behave, degrade, or wear in the lunar environment over a period we cannot say for sure. And we cannot know this unless the material experiences actual conditions. Computational modeling cannot exactly predict the longevity. But Space Factory has proposed a genius design to handle these challenges on Moon. Their design proposes what they call a lunar regolith overburden over the 3D printed structure. It's like burying the 3D printed homes under a cozy layer of lunar soil, much like a blanket. This overburden not only provides protection from lunar hazards like micrometeoroid impacts and radiation, but the presence of a thick regolith over the structure provides added weight that might help press the printed layers together. But even with a well-thought structure, there's one challenge on Moon that is inevitable, and that is thermal cycling. Temperatures on Moon can drop to minus 200 degrees Celsius during night and rise to over 100 degrees during days. The cyclic transition between extreme hot and cold temperatures can lead to stresses in the 3D printed structures that could affect the structure's integrity over years of exposure. There doesn't seem to be any solution to beat this problem. If you think you have a solution, do share your thoughts in the comment section. Many things about the regolith are not exactly known. Few of the many properties that determine material performance, such as elastic modulus, to determine material's ability to resist elastic deformation under load, coefficient of thermal expansion to measure how a material's dimensions change with temperature, strength to know the maximum load a material can withstand before it fails, and fatigue resistance to determine when the material will experience fatigue failure when subjected to cyclic loading or temperature fluctuations over time, are not very well understood for the lunar regolith. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. As we dive further, we start to learn that a face-off between the 3D printed structures and the cruel moon environment can happen in some very unique ways. Over the course of countless millennia, the unceasing impact of meteoroids upon the lunar surface has gradually disintegrated the regolith into fine particles. This, coupled with uninterrupted bombardment from solar winds due to the absence of lunar atmosphere and a magnetic field, has led to the accumulation of negative charges on the fine dust. As a result, these fine particles can accumulate static charge to such a degree that can sometimes reach several thousand volts of static electricity, enough to short-circuit electrical systems and ungrounded equipment, and can severely impact the lunar exploration, let alone building structures. And this is just the beginning. While the designs at the forefront might have taken considerations to provide radiation shielding, the long-term effects of cosmic radiation on the 3D printed material, especially the binders used, could be unique and never before experienced. And time will not just test the material. The protective regolith over the structure itself might settle with time and become more compact due to its own weight. This settling could affect the structural integrity of the 3D printed structure, particularly if it leads to uneven settling. Now that we have seen the probable fate of 3D printed structures, there is also a lot happening with inflatable systems. The problem with inflatable structures 
Numocell, an Austria-based company specializing in inflatable architecture, is envisioning a design to build within the crater walls, carving out a network of tunnels to fill with inflatable modules and tubes. You see, the lunar environment significantly differs from Earth. Unlike a planet where flowing rivers have continuously worn down rocks over millennia, the moon lacks running water to smooth these surfaces. As a result, lunar regolith particles can protrude like sharp broken pieces of glass, posing a substantial threat to inflatable structures, causing a puncture or damage. According to James Nabity, an engineer at the University of Colorado, that inflatable portion would have to be designed where it would have some sort of barrier layer that is resistant to being penetrated by those sharp particles. But even a barrier layer or skin outside the main structure is not a sure shot way to prevent damage. There are about 100 ping pong ball sized meteoroids hitting the moon per day, according to Bill Cook, who is head of NASA's Meteoroid Environment Office. And each hits the surface at speeds of up to 72 kilometers per second causing an impact equivalent to around 3 kilograms of dynamite. Bigger size weighing around 8 kgs can create an impact of 1000 tons of TNT. Even though the probability of them hitting the structure is extremely low, it can lead to sudden collapse in case it happens. The vision of a bustling lunar civilization can only be met through ingenious solutions like exploring the ability of regolith based structures to self-heal in the unforgiving lunar environment or exploring cross-domain innovations like the recent discovery of an unusual ability of electron beam to heal nanocracks in specific material that can be tweaked or explored further for healing structures on Moon. What innovations do you foresee are needed to make construction on Moon a reality? Don't forget to comment. And now I have something very important to tell. Each one of you who has reached up to this point in the video would agree that it's time when information is abundant but the truth is often obscured, so the right knowledge can shape your perspective. Through our content, we help you see through the noise. Now, YouTube is not very efficient in suggesting the content to all the right audience, so our next content might not reach you. But if you subscribe, it's sure to be delivered to you. And for this reason, I insist you to subscribe to our channel. And thanks for watching.